Welcome to Next Lab's expert Q&A series. This series was designed to inform you of relevant cybersecurity topics via expert knowledge. In this episode of the Next Lab Cybersecurity Expert Series, we have guests Bill Newhouse and Albert Kerman, both security engineers at NIST National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. For our first question, Albert Kerman will be going over what approach an enterprise can leverage to begin implementing a zero trust architecture. There are several approaches that an enterprise can leverage in developing ZTAs, and I will describe three of them, which are the enhanced identity governance, micro-segmentation, and software-defined perimeter approaches. One important point to mention here is that while each approach adopts the same principles of zero trust, they may differ in the components used and in the main source of policy enforcement that governs access requests and environments. That said, a typical full zero trust solution will most likely leverage at least two of the approaches, and hence identity governance being one of them, if not all three in today's environments. So in enhanced identity governance approach, identities and their assigned attributes play a major role in terms of creation of access policies and tailoring them further. And depending on the environment, other factors such as device use, asset status, and other environmental factors may also play a partial role in evaluation of access requests. One important point to make here is that while identity plays a main driver role in this approach, Identity also plays a crucial role in both microsegmentation and software-defined perimeter approaches. In microsegmentation approach, one would typically use a device, like a firewall, a smart switch, or a special purpose gateway, in order to segment a network to protect a resource or a small set of resources. And so they basically act like policy enforcement points. The software-defined perimeter approach basically accomplishes the same goal, meaning protecting resources by segmenting. But it achieves that goal by implementing a software-driven overlay network, which as a benefit hides the underlying actual infrastructure components such as servers, routers, etc., so that the bad actors cannot discover and attack them. Thank you for your insights, Alper. For our next question, Bill Newhouse will be discussing how zero trust architecture intersects with data classification. The federal government has a memo that says, please start moving towards zero trust architectures with a strategy. And, and, and the project that I'm now part of here at the center that I'm co-leading is called data classification. And, and I look at data classification as being a step in, on the way of taking all the data you have, making sense of it and then using it to prepare yourself to then do all the policy enforcement things that will protect it, allow it to be used and shared most importantly, and because data isn't useful if you can't use it. So it's it's data classification and I call it sort of the preliminary or the first step you, you need to do. Well, broad terms, it means examining your data and adding labels to it in a way that lets you then say, well, if it's labeled can be seen by my customers, right. you can, they can see it. If it's labeled <clears throat> protect this because it's, a, it's, 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 it's got a sensitivity and only five people should see it, putting a label on it that allows you then to have a policy that says, don't let this document go beyond those five people. That zero trust system should be able to enable that, but you had to mark it and classify it in the first place. I worked in the Department of Defense before I worked at NIST and I had to mark documents when I was on what's called the high side, confidential secret or top secret. That is a type of data classification. And, and I understood what those three labels meant and why I needed to choose them, or if I received a document that had those, how I needed to protect that data. I was doing my own bits of trust and, and, and we were in a facility that enabled you know, this data to move around. Now we're in a, an environment where everybody's on a digital system and has a cloud environment potentially sharing stuff through email, through processes, through actions, through APIs that your customer facing tools offer, APIs that you offer to your internal team so they can use your systems and your data. Well, data classification would let you mark the things you should encrypt and, and to what level, how long does it need to be protected? These are all interesting things that data 
makes you you start asking about with your data. If you're if you're a manufacturer, you know your data is is the stuff you're you're putting into your systems to be built potentially. Knowing that it should only be inside your manufacturing facility for its use and not be shared out is a way you know you could label it. Don't let it leave the factory. Then set a policy. Zero trust should enable that. So again, data starts starts this process. If you don't know enough about your data, you will be starting a zero trust program to do things like clean up your network and do authentication. Good steps for sure, but you do those things of segre segregating and segmenting your ne network or dealing with who's on my network to what? Enable people to use the data that your mission and your organization's mission or business requires. So there's a lot to go on here, but it's, that, that's our focus. Thanks for your answer, Bill. And thank you for watching this episode of the Next Lab's Cybersecurity Expert Series. Stay tuned for Episode 7, where our next guest, Emre Coxell, will cover zero trust on the file level.